mm, another edition of the Photo PXL, Photo Chat, I guess that's what we call it now. Uh, we usually have four hosts that would include me and John Cornicello. He's here with us from Seattle. And he started the whole thing with the uh, with the original photo chats during the pandemic. And uh, we would have uh, Kevin Raber, and I'm using his his uh, account. So uh, when I turn off the camera, you see his picture and not my, which is um, um, I'm still wondering whether that's better or worse. Oh, we'll see. Uh, anyway, the fourth person would have been Jeff Shuey, but he's on a on a workshop as I hear uh, today, so he can't make it. But uh, for the rest of the shows, usually they are all here. Uh, the rest of the workshop for this month, uh, for next month, would be well, the third of July. We're not going to do anything since with the fourth of July being the next day. That might be not a good idea. Um, on the 17th of July, we have Susan Mathias coming, and uh, the 31st of July is still open. We're working on a couple of uh, people to, to to get for this show, so uh, we, we're we still, uh, and this still might be a possible that uh, we can fill this date. If any of uh, the people <laughs> watching have any ideas about uh, who we could uh, add and who would be interesting to talk to, uh, let us know because I mean it's, these are photo chats from photographers for ph photographers that and that involves you. So if you have any ideas and if we can make it happen, we'll definitely do so. Um, what we could make uh, happen was to get Alan Ross today, and uh, it probably doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, he was uh, a photographic assistant to uh, Ansel Adams uh, from mid seventy four to mid seventy nine. And uh, working uh, working with him quite a lot after that, which includes uh, still printing the Yosemite Special Edition negatives for, uh, from Ansel Adams. And uh, well, we'll the way it works here is that uh, we will pass it over to Alan in a second, and then he will start a forty-five-ish minutes uh, uh, presentation, uh, and after that we open it up for discussion. Uh, I'll mute everybody in a second, uh, and that's because Zoom has this thing that is, of course, switching. If your dog barks or your, your phone rings or something, it will switch to your uh, camera and your uh, microphone. We don't really need that because <laughs> we're all here to see what Ellen is doing. So I'm going to mute everybody. If you have questions during this for the presentation, put it in the chat because uh, John is keeping an eye on that, and then we'll get back to these questions after the presentation. You can also raise your hand through the React button on the bottom some something like but that, that's more for when we get to the discussion after the presentation so not everybody's trying to get the attention just uh look on the at the bottom of the screen there's a react this is kind of a heart shaped thingy and if you uh click on that you'll find the, another button say raise hand and then we can see that you want to uh share something and obviously get to you okay so I'm gonna mute everybody, which was under post tools, I guess. It was, it was, it was not. No. It's always some mute all. That's it. So um I'm gonna mute everybody and pass this on to Ellen. It's all yours. All right. Well, I've unmuted myself. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm going to apologize right now for my voice. I've had some some kind of a affliction for the last couple of weeks. It doesn't hurt any at all, but it just sounds weird. But um, I'm in this for the count here, so we'll see what we can do. Uh, so I'm going to uh, be sharing my screen here in, in a moment. And uh, all of us... Uh, in photography, we've started somewhere, and you know we know that I wound up being Ansel Adams' assistant for a number of years, and uh, but uh, I thought I'd share a little bit about what got me going, and so I've been I've been fortunate to have had some pretty amazing mentors over the course of my uh, my career. So I'm just going to kind of a little little timeline a little bit and a little talk about Ansel uh, as a person rather than Moonrise Hernandez or anything like that. So um, I think I'll share my screen right now and uh, we'll get to it.
All right. Okay. Everybody see this. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Well, we all start somewhere. And uh, here's a little picture of Alan Ross when he was nine years old with his, his first camera and uh, some funny looking photographs next to him. Uh, in 1958, uh, we had a little family trip to Hawaii, to Honolulu. And uh, at that time, Hawaii was not a state yet. And um, I had this little brownie camera and uh, I, we, we were watching this, uh, this show of hula dancer, dancers. And uh, once again, I'm nine years old. And uh, I just thought that every motion that, <laughs> that they made was really unique. And so I moved my camera position and I uh, moved in and kept clicking pictures. And I asked my mother if I could go buy another, another roll of film. And she said, yes. And then I went through that and wanted another one. And she said, no. Um, <laughs> so that was my, my first introduction uh, to photography and in, in, in doing things. So now let's uh, jump uh, 10 years ahead. And uh, I'm now 19 years old, and uh, I've got myself a uh, a knicker mat. Boy, I've really <laughs> I've got a knicker mat, and I started doing uh, photographs of of things I just like to look at. This one on the left is a, a child's playground slide, and the one on the right is uh, a store display in San Francisco of some glasses. So I started off really doing abstracts and, and interesting things like that. And, uh, and uh, traveling around, here we have a photograph that I did of uh, somebody standing outside in the shopping center. And I just love the graphics of everything. And this other one, oh, excuse me, this other one is uh, I did on the University of California, Berkeley campus. And uh, I really, really liked it. I was, I was standing on some steps and I saw this family approaching me. And uh, even when I clicked the shutter, I visualized uh, offering the print is upside down. And oh my God, this is terrible. Uh, but I hope we can keep on going here. Um, this is uh, another about 1968. And uh, once again at Berkeley, and it, it shows a little variety of my uh, my photography. And uh, the the one on the left is a, a curved uh, pose in a in a sculpture classroom at Berkeley, and the next one is uh, of Strawberry Creek on the Berkeley campus. And you can look at the negative strips; these are adjacent frames on the same roll of film. Oh my goodness! I'm so sorry, folks. This is gotten crazy here. Um, so we have uh, my first, <clears throat> oh my God, I I don't know Just about slow this. Down. Slow down for a second. Just take a break. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Here, just a minute. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to mute myself. Um, well, I'm really surprised about this, folks. This had, uh, I'm I'm a bit embarrassed, but I don't know if you. Can... No, 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 no. You shouldn't be at all. I mean, it's uh -oh. it's really. That's why I asked before if it's causing any discomfort. Of course, then then would that would have been a, a right away. But even if you, if at some point you feel like this is this this just doesn't feel right for you, uh, and embarrassed, you shouldn't be. But if it doesn't feel right for you, we we can stop this and do something else. No, there, there's no pain at all. I'm just really uh, surprised that it's gotten to be this way. Um, mm -hmm. At any rate, I was in the design department at the University of California, Berkeley, and we got a new department chairman in the name of William William Garden, and uh, he had three Guggenheim grants for his aerial aerial photography, and uh, so we have uh, his, he flew his own plane and made photographs. Yeah, this photograph here is one of, uh, it's a photograph of the uh, sand dunes in Death Valley. And uh, he was just really wonderful. He took me under his wing. And uh, there was a uh, 
class in the design department at UC Berkeley in photography that I could repeat for credit. So I kept doing that and doing that. And I finally wound up getting an independent major in photography uh, and graduated with a, a degree that nobody else ever had. So it was kind of fun. Um, at any rate, one of the field trips, a couple of field trips with William Garnett, he introduced our class to a uh, an advertising photographer in San Francisco by the name of Milton Halberstadt. And uh, he was an amazing individual. Uh, he'd been Mahoney Naj's darkroom assistant at the School of Design in Chicago. Uh, he invented a, 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 a process called Tone Line. He had this huge studio in San Francisco. And over here, you can see all of these things tacked up on the walls. These are all awards that he'd won for his photography. And they went up the wall over the ceiling and down the opposite wall. And so I wound up just by a you know stroke of luck. After I graduated from Berkeley, I wound up being his photographic assistant. And I propelled myself from working with 35 millimeter into a scene where I'm pushing lights around and loading eight by 10 transparency film into film holders and working with advertising agents. And uh, all of this stuff is really pretty fascinating. And I can see the big saucepan stand in the corner there. Yeah, <laughs> actually, that's uh, that's uh, he had, did have an 810 saucepan, but this is uh, a light stand over in the corner hey, here. Yeah. He invented this process called tone line, which is really a it was a fabulous technique uh, that uh, involved making a an inner positive and putting it in register with the original negative, and then printing the two, and you wind up getting this negative image. It was really pretty neat. And then he did a lot of food photography. Um, this is one for an artichoke heart. A uh, company that was a competitor to a product, uh, a brand name called Pacific Mist. And so this is there are artichokes rising above the mist. Uh, it was pretty fascinating uh, bit of work to get involved with. And here we have him out in the field doing a, an advertisement for salad dressing. And he was just a genius about putting things together. Uh, and so that's it, a it's a talent that really really struck with me because <clears throat> after my time with Ansel, I wound up uh, starting my own advertising studio in San Francisco. <clears throat> but at any rate, during this period, I started falling in love with color film and abstracts. And I started doing uh, a little bit of landscape, but it was mostly uh, just scenes, things that I ran into. Uh, a window photograph in Chinatown, San Francisco, an old cable from the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, peeling paint on a window, um, old signs tacked up to a telephone pole, and a little construction flag. Uh, and then I wound up uh, doing a little architecture, a little bit more, uh, more, more landscape. And then I... Uh, in 1972, I did. Uh, I went up to uh, Yosemite. It turns out that uh, my boss Halberstadt here had a really good friend in the name of Ansel Adams, and so I went up and introduced myself to Ansel in Yosemite in 1972. And oh, thank you. I hope this continues. I went up and introduced myself to Ansel in 1972 in Yosemite, and he said, "Oh, you work for Hal? Great. Welcome. Now make yourself at home. Stay as long as you want." And uh, little did I know that I would be assisting workshops for him a year later. Halbert decided to close his studio, and I was off on my own. And so in the meantime, uh, after I uh, lost my job, I wrote Ansel and asked him if he needed an assistant. And he said no. He had a wonderful assistant by the name of Ted Orland at the time. But he invited me to start assisting workshops in Yosemite. So I started as a workshop at Yosemite in Yosemite for Ansel's workshop in 1973. And this was one of my first photographs that I did there. And then I returned in 1974 with an 8x10 camera. And then I wound up assisting uh, his July workshop making a photographic book. And my job in that, in that workshop was uh, running the darkroom for the workshop. 
And uh, that was really a lot of fun. And when I was getting set up, uh, Ansel had a new business manager at the time who hauled me aside. And I thought I was in some sort of trouble. But he told me that Ansel was uh, interested in having me, if I would be interested in moving to Carmel and working for him full time as a system number two. Well, I thought about that for a microsecond. And uh, I wound up moving down to Carmel uh, a couple of weeks later. But uh, during that same workshop, I made one of my first favorite photographs, um, Right Away I'll Fall in Storm, which I did three days after Ansel hired me. It was a good week. <laughs> so uh, at any rate, um, I showed up at Ansel's house, and this is a little view of what... Uh, the environment I was into. We have Ansel's living room here with a wall full of photographs and Ansel's piano at the end room and skylights and cabinets full of stored photographs and all kinds of other things. And uh, then his office over here uh, with him being on one of his favorite non-photographic pieces of equipment, the telephone. And uh, on the other side of him is his other piece of non-photographic equipment, this typewriter. So if he wasn't doing something with the camera or in the dark room, he was either on the typewriter or on the telephone. But Ansel himself was a really fabulous person to work with. Oh, it's just an absolute delight. And I like to share this photograph. Uh, I'd like to use this as an example as to why possibly Ansel isn't best known for his color photography. Uh, but the, the truth is that uh, he loved clowning around. He had a, an amazing sense of humor. And uh, so he loved dressing up this way. It was just fun to him. Uh, I have a photograph, a couple of photographs that his wife Virginia took of him here. Uh, he's dressed up in a tuxedo. And so clearly he's waiting to go to some sort of party, but he's clowning around putting a hat on and then a turban and then a top hat. And this is just Ansel being bored. He's waiting to just go out and have some fun. And speaking of having fun, as much as he, he was a hard worker, I mean, he was working well, you know, all the time. That's why, why I was hired. Um, you know, he didn't have any, any concept of a day off. He had 10 working for him Monday through Friday. And I was hired to work Friday through Monday over the weekend. So he had somebody on deck seven days a week. Um, but as busy as he was, he always had time for a little bit of fun. So here he is. There's a, a student at UC Santa Cruz who was doing some sort of uh, living art. And he talked Ansel into dressing up as Moses and uh, going down being photographed with his tablet. And God said, let there be light. And he divided the light into 10 zones. Uh, but at any rate, Ansel just always had, had a chance to have fun. Here we are out working, testing film, Polaroid. And here he borrowed, borrowed an Avo rug of mine to do some textural studies with an SX-70 camera, but he still couldn't help clowning around for the lens. And so this is another example of Ansel. And then we're out doing some more Polaroid work. And here he is dancing around with his dark gloves. It was just, you know, he was a real, a real treat to, to hang around. And uh, there's the two of us in Yosemite uh, during a workshop with my, by helping him set up a camera for a bunch of students. And uh, another one over here of the two of us in Tucson, Arizona. This is a, a little snapshot that Minor White did of the, did the two of us. It was clearly a windy day, but uh, that didn't stop Ansel from working and working with his uh, 4x5. We were doing Polaroid photos for his portfolio, so upcoming Portfolio 7. This is 1975. And then the two of us in his dark room. Uh, so this is, uh, this is where I worked. Uh, my job in, at, at Ansel's was to be at, in, at the sink developing prints that he had just exposed. And uh, he'd hand me a batch of prints while I'm developing one set. He'd be exposing others. And here's a, a look at his 8x10 and larger. It was uh, built out of an old studio camera. 
and it was on tracks that ran back and forth. And you see a card in front of the lens here. Uh, Ansel did not own an enlarging timer. Uh, every print he ever made in his life was timed to a metronome. So in this case, the, the larger lamp would be on 100% of the time, and he would put a card on the shelf in front of the lens. And to start the exposure, he picked the card up and then pull it away and then start counting the exposure in seconds and do his dodgy and burp and ending the exposure by putting the card back down in front of the lens. And this is a ver part of a vertical easel here that was designed, so it was horizontal projection. And this was designed for Ansel doing his, his mural prints. And, and uh, at any rate, during that time I was working for Ansel, um, he had me start to print his Yosemite special edition prints. And uh, I made my first special edition print in June 1975. So I've now, now been at it for over 49 years. And it's still a pleasure. But here's a picture of me exposing the, the print of, of Half Dome or Said River Winter here on the vertical easel with the Ansel sink behind him. So this is how I spent a lot of my time doing these prints. And like I said, I'm still doing them. That's uh, every time I get together with one of these original negatives, it's like getting together with an old friend. And uh, during, I mentioned that uh, Ansel was doing some Polaroids for his Portfolio 7. And uh, and so I like to consider that much figured that I was Ansel's last field assistant because we spent months, just the two of us driving around, looking for art, not going out testing film, not doing something for, you know, for a client or anything like that, but just going out to make art. So it was really a, a wonderful experience. So here's, here's Ansel in Yosemite setting up, and this is the Polaroid he made at this particular moment. And it was really a, a wonderful thing. And, and we did influence each other. We were up in north of San Francisco, near Bodega Bay. And I mentioned that I'd been up on a side road and photographed some nice trees. And so this photograph is a photograph I did in 1973 before I worked for Ansel. And then here's Ansel in the same, with the same tree in 1975. And the Polaroid he made actually yeah, was 1976. And so, and then another one was in Ansel's own backyard in Yosemite. Uh, this is a heating oil tank that supplied heating oil for An Ansel's house in Yosemite. And uh, I really thought it had a wonderful texture and so on. So I made this photograph in 1974. But then when we went back, and here's Ansel photographing the same tank uh, for a Polaroid. And here's the result in Polaroid. But if you can look at my photograph, Ansel liked to pre pre Ansel presented this upside down. He liked just liked the composition better with it turned around. So Ansel was really a lot of fun. Here's a couple of portraits he did of me, uh, one in Yosemite up at Mirror Lake, and then another one testing some eight by ten Polaroid film down in Carmel. But hanging around Ansel's was was a whole lot of fun. And uh, one time in 1975, shortly after People Magazine had been uh, published, uh, People Magazine hired Imogen Cunningham to come down to Carmel and photograph Ansel. And uh, she came down. Of course, they were old friends uh, you know, for decades. Ansel always asserted that she had acetic acid in her, her veins instead of blood, but they were dear friends. And so when she came down, she said, okay, now, Ansel, I'm going to photograph you, and you're going to photograph me. And uh, Ansel, Ansel said, oh, no, I'm really busy, but it's great to have you here. And just let me know when you're ready, and I'll come out, and you can photograph all you want. But she kept needling him, and finally he said, Ansel, or, yeah, he said, Alan, go get the Hasselblad. And so I went and got the Hasselblad, and here he's setting it up. And the Imogen's just kind of looking at him saying, ha, I told him, I told him he'd be taking pictures of me. And the wonderful thing is that Ansel's photographs of her were better than her photographs of, of him. This is, 
This is Ansel photographing her and some of the pictures he did of her standing outside his living room. Uh, Ansel was an amazing portrait photographer. He just loved people. And, uh, you know, he just, it was really great to see the way people would respond to him. And then 1976, we got a phone call one morning from a squeaky voice and I answered the phone and she, the squeaky voice asked if Ansel was there. And I said, may I ask who's calling? And squeaky voice said, yes, Georgia O'Keefe. And I thought, okay, hold on, I can get him for you. And it turns out that she was calling to see if she could come stay with him for a week because she was needing to get some dental work done in California. So she came out to Ansel's house and stayed there for a week. And uh, he, here is uh, Ansel positioning her for this portrait he did of her there in Ansel's living room. And then when he was done with this portrait, she went over and sat on a chair. And here's a photograph I did of Ansel photographing her assistant, Juan Hamilton, at the same time. So it was really pretty neat to have all these fabulous people come through Ansel's house. And uh, it was always a joy, but it all wasn't always Ansel's house. Um, 1975, uh, President Ford's daughter, uh, Susan, had an interest in photography and she decided she wanted to take Ansel's Yosemite workshop. So here's the president's daughter, Susan, in Yosemite, getting ready to start a workshop with Ansel. And that's me in the background there. And uh, she and I became good friends and we're still friends on Facebook. Uh, just a charming woman, really delightful. So that was really great. So that was my experience. Um, a lot of working with Ansel. And then he was also very good about letting me have vacation time once a year. And so one time I drove, decided I'd never been up to the, the Northern Rockies. So I drove up to the Tetons in October and I got up one morning and I made this photograph of the Grand Tetons in a little cabin. And then I drove up the road a little ways and the same morning made this photograph of the Tetons in Jackson Lake here. So that was really fun. Then a couple of days later, I was up in Canada and photographing an old uh, reflections in an old reservoir. And that didn't work out, but I picked up my camera and turned around. And this had been going on behind me. So I dropped everything, changed lenses, and made this photograph of the moon and clouds. So uh, this is uh, sort of a lesson to say, if you... Uh, if you give up on something you're working on, stop and turn around because there might be something else going on behind you. So I started getting involved in the in the, the photography art market. And uh, as it turns out, as I kind of suggested early on in showing some of my work, I've been fascinated with uh, photographing all kinds of things. I'm known mostly for my landscape work part, I guess largely because of my time with Ansel. But you saw I started out doing abstracts and all kinds of things. And when I first started getting going, my three most popular photographs were Yosemite landscape, a still life of an onion, and a nude. Uh, and so I'm, I still like photographing anything that interests me. And I still do a lot of abstracts and architectural work. At any rate, I think time moves on, and it got to be time for me to... Uh, leave Ansel. I was married briefly for two years. And my wife at that time and I decided we'd move up to San Francisco and I would open my own advertising studio. And so I did that. And I still knew a lot of people in the ad business because of my time with Halberstadt before Ansel. And so I got some really interesting jobs uh, photographing the Big Sur Coast for Seagate Technology, doing 8 by 10 seascapes a big sir. And uh, this one here is a photograph that I took a mile and a half south of Ansel's house. Been all the years I lived in Carmel and worked for Ansel. I never stopped here because I was always too busy to do something. But since I had the commission to make photographs, I pulled over at this site and made one of my favorite photographs. Uh, for the Young Museum in San Francisco, uh, they asked me to photograph from their their collection of Paris hats and fashion. And so I, I 
was hired to do this because of my ability in black and white. And uh, I've had a lot of, I got a call from uh, the UC uh, San Francisco Medical Center from a, a nurse there that wanted to ask me about this photograph. And she said, all these doctors here think they know everything about people, but we think it's a, this is a mannequin and they insist it's a person. What is it? And I replied, you absolutely, you're absolutely right. This is a mannequin, mannequin because the museum would not let their, their garments be worn by anybody. So that was a fun kind of thing. I wound up doing a lot of food photography, including photographing Dinah Shore at her house in, in Hollywood. She was an absolute delight, just wonderful to work with. And Julia Child, uh, another real treat to, to work with. So there's a lot of a lot of rewards to doing advertising and professional work. You wind up doing a lot of things that you'd never dream of doing otherwise. So we have uh, another one that I did, another one of my very fam favorite photographs that I did for the Bank of America. And uh, the irony on this is I grew up in Sausalito, California, which is the first town on the north end of the Golden Gate Bridge. And I would never have dreamed of, of photographing the Golden Gate Bridge, but they, uh, the bank waved a very nice financial incentive in front of my, my nose. And I wound up making a couple of my very favorite photographs, including one of the bridge at night. Uh, and in this one, I guessed the exposure because there wasn't anything both bright, and, bright enough or big enough for me to get a reading on with my spot meter. So I made four negatives, and this was my first guess. It was about a six-minute exposure. And then uh, 1984, eight days after Ansel died on Easter in 1984, I decided to make a pilgrimage up to Yosemite to just be in the place. And uh, it was pouring rain that day. And uh, I drove up to Inspiration Point. And yes, it was raining. But even so, I was still surprised to find myself the only person there. And it was so gorgeous. I got my 8x10 out under an umbrella. And I made this photograph in the rain. And so now on with a little bit of my other more recent work. Here's another one that I did in Yosemite 8x10. This is in the year 2000, um, just after a workshop I'd done there. Then uh, I made a lot of trips to China. And uh, my first trips were in 1981 and 82, when it was just opening up to the public leading. I led a couple of photo tours. And then as it turns out, in the early uh, early 2000s, I got in touch with a uh, photographer in Hangzhou uh, that loved large format and the zone system. And so I was hired to teach large format photography in China for about oh, six years on and off. And uh, it was just a marvelous experience. Um, and th this is one that I did in the Yellow Mountains. And uh, I, ironically, this is a little photograph I did with a, a tiny Nikon pocket digital camera. I'd had my 4x5 camera with me at the time, but one of our guides decided to be helpful and decided to carry my camera for me. And they'd gone off a little bit early, and I saw this scene, but I didn't have my camera with me, so all I could do was do a snapshot with a digital, and I'm still working on it to refine it a little bit. But speaking of digital, um, it's opened up a whole new world for me in many ways. Um, when I first got my digital camera, I traded a workshop for a, a Canon 5D and, uh, and a number of years ago. And so it kind of loosened me up again. I was getting to be a little bit more like I was as a, as a kid carrying my, my knicker mat around. And so I started... Uh, just being on the loose a little bit. And then I discovered that digital cameras can be made sensitive to infrared light. And so I had my Canon modified to infrared. And these are some plantains down in, down in Cuba I did during a workshop in 2019. And uh, on the right here is uh, the bottom of Yosemite Falls I did during a workshop, um, I think in... Uh, 2020. 
And uh, so, you know, I'm really enjoying doing things, photographing light that humans can't see. Um, here's another one that I just had in the show and at the Atzel Adams Gallery in Yosemite. And uh, that was a lot of fun once again, infrared. Um, I can't make a very big print from this because for infrared, even on, on film, gets pretty grainy, but it's really lovely. So what I want to kind of follow up with here is a lot of time, there's a big difference in what you get when you make a capture on film and what you can do with it later on. I mentioned, um, well, a couple of things. One is, if you make a contact sheet with film or you make a capture and it doesn't look quite right to you, don't give up because if you have the information on the capture or on the negative, there should be something you can do with it. Here's a photograph I did in uh, Guilin, China, 1981. And this one on the left is the reality of the scene that I photographed. It was smog, but it wasn't industrial smog. It was cooking smog. In those days, everyone in most of China, morning and night, cooked on charcoal. They didn't have gas or electric stoves or anything. So this is just cooking smog. And because the information was all on the negative, I was able to make a print that looks like this from the same negative. And then there's my favorite photograph of Yosemite. This is a straight print of this negative. And I could not have made a better zone system negative. This is the reality of what was in front of the lens, but it wasn't my reality. So I encourage you to get as much information in your capture or on your negative as possible. And then you can imagine what it took on this one. And by the way, I mentioned I was running the darkroom at Yosemite when I made this photograph. So I made this photograph and I had the film developed within a couple hours that same day. And here are some printing notes that I had from printing this negative in 1980. I made the negative in 74, but altogether it had, you know, a six second burn on the top and another 15 second burn on the top and then a 25 second burn on, on the top and then a, another 25 second, a two second, another 25 over in the top left and seven seconds on the top left and then some more burning on the clouds in the middle on a higher contrast paper. And I went from this to this. So I just want to say this as don't give up. If it doesn't look great at first, just photograph, work with to, to print what's in your mind, not what was in front of the lens. And so after that, have fun. Thank you. And then that's my, my end of my little share here. Thanks, Alan. That was great, and uh, it's it's even though with the with the uh, with the voice that didn't distract at all from what I saw, and oh, um, that's great. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, oh, no, really? Not not at all. It's just let let me let me uh, open this up with the first question. Sure. I was looking at your, uh, and I was totally interested when when we met online for the first time, and you said that you were doing infrared. Yeah, I was thinking that's that's something that's in line with. With probably what you uh, lift with, uh, with with what you did with uh, Ansel, because I think he was always so into. He would be interested in infra infrared. I could totally imagine. Oh, that. Ansel loved technology, and yeah. uh, he he would love the love the 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 possibilities of digital. Um, but on the on the same same token, you can't hold on to a handful of pixels. So a f piece of film is tangible, and so. Um, you know, I still love film. I still work with film, but uh, the the big cameras are getting heavier and heavier all, all the time. And with my workshops, I have a hard time carting around a big camera like I used to. So uh, it's just a, a continuation of of my adventure. But my first uh, introduction to uh, to infrared was actually with Kodak high speed infrared that I I did uh, illustrating. Um, a series of uh, photo textbooks, uh, Basic Techniques of Photography by John Schaefer, uh, an Ansel Adams guide. And John Schaefer is one of the trustees of the Ansel Adams Trust, and he was president of the University of Arizona in Tucson and personally responsible for the existence of the Center for Creative Photography there. 
So I'd like to put a plug in for those two books because they're cool. really, really, really well done. Um, so Basic Techniques of Photography and Ansel Adams Guide by John Schaefer. And so I had to photograph a church um, here. And uh, let me uh, share my screen well uh, here again in just a second. Here, I'm going to just show you a photograph. Uh -huh. Ah, uh, let's see here. I, um, uh, let's do, 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 do. Let's see. I'll be with you in a sec. Where is that? Yeah. Well, why, why are you looking for this? Uh, the question I actually had was, when I was looking at this, uh, your uh, picture of Ride Wave Fall and, yeah. and at the one you did in the, with, with infrared. Yeah. Uh, in, did your, did your, what was your concept of, of what photography is and what you want to do in photography always that open and flexible that it could include now something like infrared or did it change over the years to to be able now to 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 look at uh, at stuff like infrared and to be able to include that in in your your concept of photography well i, I think what it, what appealed to me was being able to actually see what i was doing uh whereas worth working with film um let me just, I will share my, my screen just really quickly here. This is, this is, uh, whoops, this is a, his, his film, uh, four by five high speed infrared Kodak. And uh, I set this up for an illustration in the, in the textbooks I mentioned, but getting this photograph was a total guess. I had to guess on the focus. I had to guess what the film might be seeing. But the beauty of it is with digital, the sensor, particularly now with a mirrorless camera, you can actually see what the sensor is seeing. And so now I can hold the camera up to my face and I can see, see an infrared. So I'm seeing light that humans can't see. And it's <laughs> exciting. Wow. For me, what was interesting was your, your bridge between the commercial and the art world. I grew yeah. up on the East Coast and I was just surrounded by commercial photographers all the time. Yeah. I got a late introduction to the art world when I moved to the West Coast. So that was really interesting to see you doing the commercial work. Well, that was one of the things about this guy, Alberstadt, that I worked for. Um, he was very creative. Uh, we did uh, color solarizations uh, creatively. He did tone lines. He did uh, the, uh, the did, uh, photo reversal. Um, yeah, he did all kinds of creative things in his career as art. And so uh, that really stuck with me as being a, you know, a, a photographer for hire. I wasn't stuck with just photographing a product. I could still go out and be creative and make my own, yeah. my own photographs. Yeah, I could totally see that that is a better way to, to, to spend your time. You could separate that and say, I'm doing the commercials to pay the bills and then uh, I'll do my personal work, which is just about making me feel good. But uh, why not also use your time on this this commercial stuff uh, to learn? I mean, that being creative there is, is learning. It's learning is something you might as well use on, uh, on the art side of, of what you do. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things about him working for Hansel is that he was a, a um, people think of him as being a techno fanatic. He was nothing but, uh, nothing at all like that. Uh, he was a musician. And for Hansel, testing film and so on was no different from playing, playing scales. He didn't want to hit a wrong note. And on top of that, he was a, he'd been a professional photographer since he was 28 years old, 1930. <laughs> and in all of that, he learned a lot by being a professional. And when you're a professional, you don't want to go out and tell your client that, oh, well, you muffed the exposure. Sorry about that. So that's another reason for being on top of your technique is 
knowing knowing what you're going to do. Ansel's, one of Ansel's favorite lines was, chance favors the prepared mind. And when he ran into Moonrise Hernandez, uh, he was prepared. He couldn't find his light meter, but he had a pretty good idea about how to go about exposing. And uh, so there's all kinds of things like that. But yes, being a technician, being, you know, working for commercially absolutely keeps you in tune. Definitely. So we'd like to open it to the audience. Does anyone have any questions or comments they want to add here? Uh, There's something on I the chat. Just put something in the chat. When you shoot infrared, what wavelength filters are your favorites? Uh, right now I'm using a, um, the really strong infrared. I'm interested in doing some color infrared. I have a good friend, of Nevada Weir, who does some amazing color infrared work. I think she uses a 590. I'm using, I think I'm using a seven, seven something real strong infrared. You, you can hold it up to the sun and you can see something through it, but that's about it. You can't, otherwise you can't see any, anything through it. Uh, and I, so I really like the strong infrared. So you, are you using you know, currently a mirrorless converted to infrared or, or the? Yes. Yeah. I have a Canon EOS M6 that I really love. Which, which EOS was that? Uh, it's the EOS M6. M6, cool. Yeah. I think they don't make it anymore. They make an upgraded model, but mm -hmm. it's it's a wonderful camera. And you can, you know, iPhones are sensitive to infrared too. Mm. They are? Yep. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you can get an infrared filter and put it over your iPhone and, uh, and go to town. Cool. I believe I still have some rat and infrared filters somewhere in the basement. <laughs> I think, yeah. Yep, get a number, uh, number eight, 87, I think it is. I think mine was a 98 or something. I'd have to, it's been yeah. a long time, but I'll go look. <laughs> okay. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. But is it really, if, if you're, you're going in for it, do you have to relearn a lot of stuff? Uh, I mean, the editing process is very different than, than uh, no, it's not. I just I uh, I, do all of, I edit all, I import all of my my digital work into Lightroom and make basic adjustments and, and stuff there. But I do all of my tweaking in Photoshop, and uh, that's no different from working at you know another digital image for me, dodging and burning and contrast control and all of that. You know, I, I, I dodge and burn in digital the same way I do in the dark room, <laughs> with the same intent anyway. So speaking of dark room, Richard's asking in the chat, what's your overall view on the quality of yeah. printing versus dark room printing? Uh, digital printing? Well, uh, they look they're, they don't look the same. And I have to say that uh, I have one or two images that uh, I can get a little bit more out of it digitally than I can in the dark room. Uh, you know, like little local contrast controls and working on very small objects, it's possible. Um, but there's still at the same time a, a beautiful piece of, of Ilford multigrade coming up and the developer has its own, own feel and look. Um, but uh, I like them both. They're different. And uh, there's a place for both of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like you know, what you're doing. If you're learning something new, like infrared or whatever is coming next, it's not like you're dropping anything. You're still right. doing the the large format or whatever you did before. Yeah, I have some here. Oh, I'm gonna get it. something that I couldn't do in the dark room very easily. It's some portraits I did of Ansel Adams and Yusuf Karsh in Yosemite, teaching a workshop and being able to work, put four images together of the two of them. Uh, it's really pretty special. <laughs> very nice. It's great. Uh, and also too, uh, working digitally, I kind of... I uh, feel like I'm a I'm a plein air painter. If there's a 
uh, fence post and the image that I don't want there, I don't have to include it. <laughs> so okay. there's some other things there too. <laughs> I'm not getting into AI though. No. no. <laughs> Understood. You know, like Ansel, we we retouched the the LP out of the hillside in his winter sunrise photograph. So, uh, you know, hey, it was in the way. It was distracting, so we got rid of it. <laughs> uh, it's have, when you, when, uh, when you're doing your workshops, do we have a lot of young people there? Is there like uh, some interest in in, in doing uh, learning about this? Uh, in younger in the younger generations, or is that uh, are we in like a dying breed here? Uh, no, there's more and more young people getting involved. Uh, you know, I've got a friend up in Idaho who I think is maybe 23 years old. He's got a couple of eight by ten cameras. He loves film. Uh, he's a, an art welder by trade, but uh, you know, he just loves film. I've got a woman uh, <clears throat> in Australia. Uh, you're a young woman, and she and some friends have opened up a, a black and white processing lab and color processing lab. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's called, called the Silver Allied Studio. Uh, another friend up in Washington, I'm getting more and more young people that are just really mm. going for it, and it's great. And do you think that's then... Uh... I mean, this, this, these times are really too much about technology, uh, technology maybe, and people like to probably go out in, in nature and, and just slow down everything a little bit. And you, you think that might be a reason for stuff like that, that you get more younger people interested in film photography because it's not so much about uh, spray and pray, but really thinking about what am I doing here? Exactly. And uh, I mean, the, the current generation is, has grown up with computers and technology and all of that. And, you know, go into a dark room and you have this safe light and you see this image appear in a tray of liquid. It's, they think it's pretty neat. And once again, you can't hold on to a handful of pixels, but a piece of film is there. Yeah. And so I think um, I'm hearing of a lot of, a lot of more schools or, you know, redoing dark rooms and getting things set up again. I yeah, think it's, it's very interesting. It's really recently about some schools that have just bought a bunch of enlargers, like 10 enlargers for a school. So, right, so, yeah. Freestyle Photo in Hollywood uh, is mm -hmm. very involved in, in, in supplying educational facilities and students and stuff with gear. Um, it's, it's really quite good. Cool. Quite exciting. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Does anyone help? Oh, here, some Jaime's put something else in here. What were some challenging images you made? What was the challenge about the situation, and how do you overcome the challenge to make the image work? You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were some? Well, well, I, I think maybe uh, something like that uh, photograph I made in Guilin, China, uh, you know, fighting all of that smog and everything, coming up with something that was very difficult from the reality of what was in front of the lens uh, was something like that. And, uh, you know, it's pretty difficult. And uh, so, I, you know, challenge is a good thing. I've got a, a friend in New York who's been struggling with a photograph uh, of hers, and she's just not, hasn't been able to quite do it. So she's asking me to give her a hand, see if we can make a print that works for her, uh, whether it's involving some of my selective masking or or whatever. But she wants a silver print, not a, not digital. So uh, you know, so there you are. Uh, there's there's challenges ahead of us, and uh, we just have to see what we can do to to do what we want to do. So and that fits in with the uh, the question that Jim has. What is the next project you want to do? Well, that's a funny thing because I've never been project oriented. Uh, as you can see, I mean, from my earlier work, my work is all over the map. I've never, never been, you know, photographing this subject or photographing that. Um, like I showed you in the beginning, I had a lovely little streamside landscape and a photograph of a hose in a sculpture workshop. Uh, and, you know, there are adjacent frames on the same roll of film. And so my work is all over the place. 
And uh, I like doing that. I think probably one of the things that's on my on my want to do list is is maybe doing a book. I've never taken the time to do something like that, but I'd like to you know get something out there that's a lot more than my uh, my landscapes. Yeah. Also, I was uh, and I, I want to mention that I heard your podcast on uh, Matt Payne's show, which yeah. is uh, F stuff co collaborate and listen. And Alan was on there on May the twenty seventh. Uh, and and what I heard was uh, something I'm I'm usually more interested in than than technical questions. You talked a lot about stuff like there was this this metaphor with the with the potato with uh, everybody's doing potatoes differently and everybody's seeing the world differently and, and thinking oh, about absolutely. everyone. And has that I think that was really you have to go and listen yeah. to that podcast, podcast people because that was uh, really although the, you can't see any big pictures in the podcast. It was very, very interesting and time flew by just listening to the ideas. And I was thinking when you had this compa comparison of, of uh, the, the, the reality of the lens and the reality for the photographer, these are the, exactly the questions I think people should be dealing with. Because uh, thinking about reality, what it really is for you and, and, and that, that ties into why you like a picture and why you don't like the, the next picture. Because the, the reality that the, the creator, the ph photographer sees is so different. We can stand on this uh, the very same spot and we'll have a totally different picture because I see something else. Yeah, can you give us the name of that podcast again? What? Can you give the name of that podcast again? It's called F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen. And it's done by Matt Payne. Colorado. It's in. It's you on the podcast and wherever you get that. You put a link yeah, in one, the chat. One oh. of the things that I like best about black and white photography is that, by its very nature, it's an abstraction of reality. And uh, with color photographs, and I've done a lot of color in my life, both landscape and still life and other stuff. But that's all. You know, for the most part. There's this expectation of reality. And so I show you a picture of a landscape. You say, that yeah, that's a picture of the landscape. Whereas if I show you a black and white, there's it brings something. It's more of a message, a statement. Like, for instance, the bridal bell fall behind me. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that you know, if I give you a landscape with a green sky, you're going to, unless I'm doing something kinky, you're going to say there's something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, it's you, there's a, a literal something about color, whereas with black and white, it's automatically an abstraction. And for me, that's a little bit more expressive, light and tone and shape and texture. So Richard wanted to continue on his question about prints in film. Richard, you want to ask the question yourself? Oh, uh, just the question I had was, well, I, my comment was that I agree with you on the tangible quality of um, film versus digital files. And uh, my own view is that uh, I like to make a lot of prints because I feel that prints have a, a, la a very much a lasting value and they're a, a physical record of what I've seen and produced. So I just wonder if you have any further comments on that. Well, I think, you know, making a print uh, you know, there's nothing permanent about a digital image. And I just think of all these families and people that are going to lose everything when they have a hard drive crash and they haven't backed things up. Or even if you've got it on some sort of disc, what are you going to do if you find a box of floppies under grandma's bed? Um, <laughs> yes. Are you going to find anything that can read the files? Are you going to find anything that if you could read the disc, anything that can read the file? So, uh, you know, there's a real obligation of backup, 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 and making a print. Um, you know, at least with a negative, there's something there. And, uh, you know, that, that I think yeah. is really, really important. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, thank you. You bet. Very good. If we don't have anything else, then... I think we should wrap yeah, this, this up. Been great. What? I don't know. It's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed this one quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Pictures, pictures were great. <laughs> and I think we could uh like I said, if you listen to to the podcast, I just know we could be sitting here for hours. 
and talking just about stuff like that because I, I I totally love that. I'm totally into this this kind of stuff uh, about the the thought process behind that, and that's that's why you can. Uh, uh, there's a lot to learn from Alan about that also. Well, just photograph what's inside, not what's in front of the lens. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> I could I could put something better to end this. So cool. I'm, I'm think I'm just stopping this recording here. Remember, we are back on uh, July seventeenth with Suzanne Suzanne Mathias, and uh, thanks for popping in, and we see you there. All right, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Alan.